kind of wrote about was this thing that I've always been desiring from I was a young man I desired to to kind of I never felt I was part of a group and I was I started to I was looking to 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 a chance to leave to kind of explore other possibilities and I did that very much through I spent like seven eight years from I was early 20s till I came to England I was traveling uh, traveling everywhere uh, and um, so that that was kind of that has kind of influenced the way that I, I work where I kind of feel that I'm looking at I'm looking for stuff that is the hidden stuff that is that kind of stuff that is that is there that we all share that is part of our everyday life experience but that it's maybe it's not that visible so so that's that's basically what I'm what I'm very very intrigued by and then these films that I picked I think that they all had in various ways um, various ways these kind of aspects to them where it was about like looking where it was about like feeling I think especially if I'm kind of you know Penny's film it's I when I saw it the first time I was absolutely struck by it because I felt that there was something about the film the way that shows the humanity of everyone that shows you know the, the small concerns that we all have that we all share and you have that even in a situation where we're extremely extremely vulnerable um so I, I just kind of feel that 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 is kind of what what draw me to kind of pull these films together So these days we all film with tiny cameras and there's usually one person, maybe if you're lucky you have one other person, but it's, it's very kind of, you know, it's easy to slip in and not really be seen. Um, I was still filming on film then. So it was filmed on Super 16. This is in the year 2000 and I had a crew. So I had, a, you know, some a DOP, a cameraman, they were both men, and a sound recordist and a, an assistant. And they were all over six foot tall, you know, <laughs> so they were very present. And I think there's a bit of a misconception now where people think, oh, you know, you have to film for hours with these little cameras and nobody knows if you're filming in order to get, you know, that kind of intimacy. And really it's all about relationship and whether people are comfortable. People have felt trusted me. I'd spent quite a long time myself and Rachel Das, who's my assistant, we spent quite a few weeks in the wet house before filming. And that was partly something that I wanted to do because I needed to be sure that people understood that we were making a film and that they were going to be seen on film. And not so much that people in general would see, but if there was, you know, uh, children or people that they were close to who would suddenly see their relative in that state, you know, that that could be a, a really painful thing. So I had to make sure that everybody understood that this was going out on national TV and they would be seen. and. Eventually, you know, two or three people said, I don't want to be in it. I don't want my sister to see me like that. But most people were like, this is who I am. And there was a kind of, you know, uh, owning that state and not feeling that they wanted to hide. I remember Big Sean, who was the one who died, he said, I'm a tramp. And he felt that was his identity. And I'd remembered seeing him in King's Cross years before, sort of going across the road, shouting and thinking, wow, is there something kind of amazing about him? He seemed like a kind of knight or a sort of, you know, figure from Cervantes or something. So I suppose it was more me because I spent so long before filming and eventually they were going, when are you bring the cameras? You know, <laughs> like I'd waited sort of too long. So I, that was for me, I needed to be sure that I could feel ethically comfortable filming. 
and that anybody, the, the people who didn't want to be filmed, I always made sure that they were behind me and that they weren't going to be in the scene. And that, that was never a problem. So I never do secret filming. And I know some people switch off the red light so that people don't know. I, I feel morally that that's wrong actually because you know we're there we're making a film and we're not sneaking around trying to stitch people up so I, I i think if you're not judging people people can just feel it and and that was that was the feeling there so in the scene we we ended up only filming for five days because so much happened in those five days and that dinner scene where there were all kinds of you know fights and people collapsing and everything and at the end of it a couple of them came and they said we gave you a good one tonight <laughs> you know like <laughs> they actually you know so in a sense you're right there's an element of performance where people were going we've we've shown you we've shown you something that is <laughs> for your film and um yeah willie Willie the wig who had his wig askew and singing was like that all the time, you know, so, um, but it was, yeah, it was a special moment in a way, because sometimes you could have a very quiet dinner, you know, in which not so much happened. Uh, but, they, um, they watched the film after finished the film, after you finish, or they didn't watch? They did watch it, and actually a few people said that a lot of people had given them money on the stream because they recognised them, you know. And so I, I went back a few times afterwards, and nobody had had any bad feedback from it, you know. In fact, the opposite. They said people had been really nice to them. Um, and so something about, the, I suppose, the kind of warmth and the love that I felt is in the film, even though it's quite an unflinching film. Um, nobody, because one of the big revelations for me is that, you know, you see people and they appear to be very out of control and people are afraid, but actually they never attack anybody. They, they are the butt of other people's attack, you know, Michael Chandler, who'd been burnt, everybody had these horrible stories about, you know, people leaving glasses of piss or kicking them when they were asleep and so on. So it's people like us who are the perpetrators, you know, and, and, and that was important for me to show. And I think one of my, you know, things I was really pleased about that people said afterwards is that they it is that they weren't afraid. You know that I think we're afraid of people because they make us feel ashamed that somehow we've let them down. That then turns into anger, as it does with refugees or any people who are really vulnerable. You know, they somehow we flip it so that they become uh, the kind of enemies and the the hostile people, whereas actually we're the ones who are pushing them out. That's amazing. My feeling was that during the filming that for me, it was like a, a, the camera trophy for them too. somehow. I thought that somehow I thought that they are they know the camera is filming and they are acting somehow mm -hmm. that they like it and to do something. You know, but I was confused. But it, that was beautiful that you couldn't understand that they're acting or is completely real is completely. I mean, it was like that all the time in the yeah. warehouse. So I didn't feel that we had specially selected, you know, moments. It was, it was very intense there. And I had never, initially I hadn't intended to make a film in, in, in a residential, in a hostel. I was gonna make a film about street drinkers outside, which I subsequently did. I made another film called On the Streets 10 years later. Um, but I visited the wet house. I can't remember who suggested it. And I walked in and it was, I was so kind of blown away by it. And, and in a way quite shocked, you know, which for me is difficult because usually I don't, I don't feel I'm a, a person who's easily shocked. So I thought I had to stay there and I had to kind of break through these, the feeling of, you know, being in a way, because I could so see that be horrified to get to a better place, you know, which was not of horror, but of common humanity. 
because I could see that you were very involved and just completely obvious. You was very close to them. And I thought about you too. And I thought, oh my God, after this journey, definitely if I was there, I needed to go to psychotherapy and to find myself the, uh, because it was painful somehow to living with them and to experience every moment of their life. And it wasn't easy. And uh, just that, that thank you big thank you that you shared this amazing uh, and I never uh, honestly after that I tried to it was very interesting that after I watched your films in the street when I saw any homeless and I'm going to close to him and start to talk with him or her mm. and it was a wow that's very beautiful that the films really affect on me yeah the one thing just that I know we want to talk to the others but we had a, a screening at the National Film Theatre as it was then at the BFI and lots of people who are in the film and also people you know from from the streets came and somebody in the audience said what should I do when I, if I see people like you in the street and they all shouted speak to us <laughs> and, that, and that's the thing which I don't always achieve it because you're not, you know, if you're giving money, you're giving money for somebody to buy drink or drugs. When I'm paid for work, nobody says you can't buy a bottle of wine with it. You know, I, it's not up to us what people spend the money on. But you say so you can choose to give or not give. But what I always try and do is to look somebody in the eye and um, and just smile, even, even if that's all it is. It's saying, I see you, you're not invisible. So if that's one thing that can come out of the film, then... It's beautiful. It's beautiful. But, but I also think that that is what makes the film so strong, that it is listening so intensely to what they have to say. So, but what you actually get is like you, you, you get such a strong sense of what, how their relationships and how they, how they deal with everything. And it's just like they deal with it very, very well. I mean, that, that I think for me, what, was, what I was so amazed by was like, you know, you got an insight into the intricate detail of their everyday life. And I thought that that really blew me away. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very surprising, you know, when I was looking for the link to send, I'm very disorganized, I'm afraid. And I found it wasn't the one that I sent a link on YouTube that somebody had just put it out there in 2019. And it's got over half a million views from where I don't know. Um, it's really odd, you know, on my website, I don't know, maybe it's a couple of thousand or something. But somehow, I think all of us must feel this sense of you know, not wanting to live with the kind of discomfort of walking past people and looking down on them. I think most of us don't want to do that. That's very interesting. And also, um, I thought that when they're fighting is that I think it was part of they love each other. It was part of the, do you know, fighting and loving each other. It was exactly the same for me. That was fascinating. And honestly, um, I watched the film two times and mm -hmm. Uh, and it was painful, but uh, it was really a strong film. And uh, George and Emma, did you watch the uh, Penis Field? Yeah. Um, I, I was, the thing that surprised me most after watching it is that this isn't more of a thing. That the idea that if, you, if you're an alcoholic, you can't have a roof over your head is kind of crazy it's like you're inferior because you have this problem um and yeah i really appreciate it as well how you gave people a space to ex ex explain themselves in, in a sense like that everyone's a product of their background a lot of them have had traumas and all this kind of stuff and yeah it's just amazing that they had this space where they could just be who they were it's funny watching it, you know, there's certain points that make me laugh. And that's because I know people. And I remember at the time people were, you know, it was kind of funny being there as well, but it was much more difficult in audiences. I'd be the only person laughing. <laughs> they must think I'm this really unfeeling person, you know, because, <laughs> but I guess because I knew that, that the, the people in the warehouse also found things funny. It was, <laughs> Think kind of possible to have some humor, you know. And um, 
you know, I think he, they call him the bricky sort of walking and he's trying to, <laughs> and he's going, the door is that way, you know, it's just, yeah. It's amazing. And Emma, uh, how about you? Did you watch the film? Um, I actually didn't get a chance to watch it. I will in the next week or so. But um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say, like, the concept of a wet house was um, quite interesting to me. Um, so I'm really excited to see the film. Um, I used to work in a rehab for a bit, and it was quite like a, a very restrictive, like, Puritan, kind of quasi-religious atmosphere. And, um, like, just keeping in touch with a few people um, from, like, five or six years ago now, um, some people really do struggle with that restrictive like, atmosphere and um, it's quite a narrow way to to get clean so it works for a lot of people and like that's why they carry on doing it but um, I think a few people can slip through and like really struggle with um, being clean of completely everything and having this very structured kind of um, hierarchy like sponsors meetings that kind of thing mm. so um, yeah I'm, ex I'm excited to see it and I think it's a really interesting idea. Uh, okay, let's talk about your film, Emma. Uh, and uh, and uh, Lasse, could you talk a little bit about introduce Emma's film to us? Thank you. Yeah, Emma's film is what what fascinated me was like the um, this the very simple approach. You know, walking between uh, London and Birmingham. Uh, and then and then kind of talking you talking being taking the role of being the main narrator of that and then you're meeting people along the route you're getting to know people you understand your motivations um, and I find I found that it was really really intriguing the the rhythm of the piece made it all kind of feel so it just progressed so gently and 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 also the interviews that you did with the people that you just encountered as as interesting people on route they're really really strong and they are building a strong story that gives us an impression not only of of the location that you are in but also of of our time where we are at the moment especially i'm thinking about the the young boy that is uh, going to um uh, join the army it's it's really like kind of really really intriguing to hear, and it really makes you think about what what is going to happen to him. Uh, thank you, Emma. Uh, I watched your film and I really enjoyed. Thank you very much, and it was very interesting for me because I'm in Kuwait too. I'm coming from <laughs> Iran and I'm living in London. Then I want to know. The London and London people and the culture of this country and uh, to touch them and to understand them I normally I took my camera and I start to walking in the city and I look at the two city and people with the camera and this relationship give me more uh, closeness and just I can understand from the from my camera the city and the people more than just normally when I'm in underground or bus or just with bicycle and other things, just walking through the space, place to place with the camera, it's really amazing. And I want to know that the concept uh, about the space and place that you walked with the camera and have a conversation and dialogue between the space and people and what mm -hmm. happened, why? Because uh, I had the same idea, but it's very interesting that two girls from Afghanistan arrived in London six months ago, and I try to teach them, I'm teaching them um, mm, cinema, and I gave them the camera and I told them just walking in the city and took a, just take a photos, and by walking in the city and just filming, and we are walking together and just filming the city shooting in the city because I want they understand more the culture and place and uh, people and when I watch your film and honestly we watched one time together with three, three sisters from Afghanistan too and because I once explained for them from your films that why I'm telling them 
walking in the city and have a conversation with British people or other people with your camera and just recording, recording everything. And then we are sitting together and we are watching a game. We are watching the city, people come listen to conversation and everything. It was very interesting and fascinating for me. And could you uh, tell me about this combination of what happened to you? You decided to walk in the city between two places and conversation with people with camera. Um, well, so first of all, I, um, walking is my favorite way to travel because um, you can stop. And it's like, it's a nice free way to travel because you can walk as fast as you want and stop and look at things and talk to people and then carry on. Um, and you get a real sense of distance between places. Um, so with this journey, um, I grew up in Birmingham and I'm living in London. So I was more interested in the, the space in between the two places and how they're connected. And the route I chose was um, down the Grand Union Canal, which connects um, the two cities historically because of trade. Um, and at the moment, it's really the only way to move between the two cities without any impediments. Um, so the canal is just basically a through route at the moment. It's a, it's a pedestrian route, and it's really the only one that's like easily navigable. Um, yeah, I made a few detours along the journey down country roads and A roads, but you know, a lot of the time there are no pavements. A few times I had to go through farmers' fields and then end up getting to a ditch and not really knowing which way to go. Um, so I thought the the canal was just quite an interesting way to find connections between villages, communities, and towns. And yeah, and the people I met along the way, I sort of um, created maybe sort of uh, two dimensions to the films. Like the people I met were settled. Um, a lot of the time they'd grown up in the place they were living and working in. And for me, I was just passing through. And that's generally been my experience through life. Like I thought um, Lasse's description for the curation was really nice because um, a lot of what my film deals with is the feeling of belonging. And um, I think in the end, it, it sort of wasn't too important an idea for me because I'm um, sort of satisfied with, with the idea of not being settled and not really belonging and just passing through and encountering people who have built a life and have found like a, a, a feeling of settlement. Um, so, yeah, it was sort of just a celebration of both dimensions of living. Yeah, are you making a new project at the moment? Um, nothing film-wise at the moment. I'm um, thinking of an idea this summer. Um, I'm drawing closer to the idea of maybe scripted reality. Um, so maybe that's how you describe it. Um, I'm writing a sort of fiction uh, story, um, maybe almost a novella, but a short story. And I'm playing with the idea of like writing this story and having real people read it and scripting the narrative in a fictional way, but having the people improvise dialogue. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm working on at the moment, but it's like very scattered and not really solid, so. Um, and that was an estate that was just about uh, to be converted, to be gentrified, basically. Uh, and it had, it had a very long history, problematic history. It used to be called, like, you know, heroin heaven, blah, blah, blah. And the, the girl, Andrea Zimmerman, that, that I was living with there, uh, we started to think about, well, maybe let's do some work there. So, so in a way, I have a, you know, we were, I was working for like five, six years a lot with housing issues and gentrification. And then I thought that when George, uh, when I saw George's film, I felt that this was a really, this was a very free way, open way of dealing with this because it is like an issue that it's, it's very easy that you get into 
um, a very strong, like right or wrong way. Here, I feel that what George did, I think that he kind of investigated the, the issues, the, the process of this, of this change in, in a way that gave everybody a voice. And I, I really, really appreciated that. And then also what I really loved about the film was the, was this, was the way that it was shot and the way that it was edited. My favorite part of the film is like where you have this like jazz music coming in and then you just see there is a montage of people doing stuff. And it just blew me away so much. And then after that, you know, we go back to, to the story again. So I thought that, that there was lots of stuff with the film that I thought was really magic um, and I really loved. So, um, yeah, George. Thanks, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess like the, the project started out, I didn't really know what I was looking for. It was more kind of lots of different points of interest. And through that, just chat to loads and loads of different people. So it kind of, the, instead of forcing a story to appear, it kind of told itself in that sense. Um, and yeah, it's definitely interesting like, learning about how this sort of, this community was just so ingrained and then the people who are then trying to change, change the community, like who has the power to do that? Um, and for a lot of people, um, you, well, you, you, can't, you can't build a community from scratch. It kind of is quite an organic thing, but it's quite, quite interesting seeing one, one man's vision, how that, how that shapes people and um, sort of cross-referencing that from the different lives that live side by side. And they, they all share this landscape, but they don't, they don't cross paths. Um, so I thought the power station was a, a really good sort of anchor point for everyone to be connected over. Um, yeah. I think it's really intriguing as well that because the film shows that enormous difference between people as well, you know, that how people's life was shaped by economy, by, you know, by all these things. And, and, and still it shows that there is a lot of things that, that they share. But I find, I, I just find that ambiguity between you know, as you're saying, sharing a location, but then also being so different, you know, the opera singer is very, very different from the poacher. You know, that's like such, a, such an enormous difference there. And I think that the film is, is doing a really good job in, in exploring those issues as well. George, can you, he can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. George, I have a question, maybe it's technical, but uh, maybe silly questions, but during the, your shoot, when you're shooting the film, during the shooting the film, did you think about the um, script and writing or you didn't? During the editing, you decided about the concept and conversation and uh, to build the, this combination between images and interview and like that. Uh, yeah, no, that, that wasn't really a script. Like, like I was saying, it was very sort of things we were interested in. So we talked to a lot of people about all the different elements that we, we were interested in. Um, we, I shot it with a friend of mine. Um, so yeah, like the mudflats, for example, were something we thought was, uh, that, that's something that's changing, that's slowly disappearing. So it's quite, a, and everyone's got their relationships to it. So it's a nice reference point to get people talking about that. And the power station, which was so big, was this sort of a, a big part of everyone's life, whether like they'd literally worked on it or they'd, they'd just seen it in their back garden. So, so I had, had the, the rushes were huge. So had all these different elements and then going through the edits where, where it really came together, where you sort of see all these different ways that they they are they are connected um but it, it was a really nice experience just not having a specific goal as it were um and yeah just letting the sort of piece of the puzzle come together as they as they naturally like the opera singer for example 
she we actually filmed that because because we were trying to interview her for a while but she finally let us do it because she wanted us to film that song for her because she'd collaborated with this Brazilian musician so it was kind of just uh, a, a project for her but in, and there, there were maybe like four or five different takes of that some of them up close but I used that take because it sort of showed her like in with the landscape behind her this sort of all this land her family sort of owns and she lives in um so so yeah it was it was just kind of point by point place by place sort of feeling what felt right to that penny did you watch the george films you told that I did, yeah, and I, I thought it was a very clever film about class, really. I mean, that was just, you know, my reading of it and how, you know, the poacher is so subversive, isn't he? He has his own power, he's just refusing to go along with the rules and, um, yeah, shooting and fishing and finding his own way to, to challenge the, the system. And it's very rare in a film to see people who are, you know, the landed aristocracy in the film. It's, it's very rare and certainly to see them in the same film. Um, I mean, I, I really struggled, but, you know, I thought it was very interesting that this incredibly sort of rich woman who owns all this land is kind of appropriating this song that, about poor black people, you know. And, it's, and I, I, I thought she was a terrible singer, actually, but um, she didn't think that. But it was, a, it was a very interesting moment, you know, in which it wasn't that I didn't feel you were mocking her or anything like that. I really did didn't but at the same time I thought she had sort of set herself up really in a very unreflective way and again the you know the the, the aristocratic money it sort of goes back to this concept of new towns that somehow you scrap everything and you can build something new and then you know everything is going to be all right you know you're going to dissolve the the, the all the problems of you know in massive inequality <laughs> class and race by building this new town and somehow that he has the resources to decide what is best for everybody you know it's very much what we're seeing at the moment with a sort of top-down approach to everything oh we're going to level up you know and then you have those little shots of the food bank you think really what does he know about that nothing so yeah I thought it, it in a very sort of um and then Lassa was using a gentle and very gentle way. Um, it, it's, it's quite a sort of fierce film, I think, you know, looking at, at who we are. And I, I, I think that what is really successful about it is that it does it in a, in, in a, in a different way. Mm. It, 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 it allows for that, it, it gives you the space to read these things and to make those conclusions on your own. It's not something that is going out and saying this, 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 and this, but it just shows it. And it is that combination of stuff that I feel is, is very successful. Yeah, um, that kind of idea of, like that kind of disconnect of the man who's building the town. It, it's interesting because he kind of has all the answers. It's like very academic, but, he, but his, the nature of who he is and his life is very disconnected yeah. so it, it is interesting like when you see the people who do really live there and you know he'll talk about the statistics of how it is a deprived area and he does know it and he's got all these things that will fix it but then the town is going to be the sort of grand roman architecture smart town with all these sort of apps that lift your boats into the water and that kind of stuff um and then, yeah, seeing, seeing the poacher who really lives in that land and really sort of lives like hand to mouth. And that's, that, that new world just isn't for him. And of course, there's the element of the, the city people moving down there and turning it into their playground. Whereas you have Nigel the poacher who, again, like he, he lives it. And he, he really is the last of his kind. He, he's a dying breed, the kind of the working class, men who, who, who they kind of they, they love nature they're they're in it but they're they're outcasts and he actually his father um back in the day he was kicked off the estate for poaching and where he lives now in a 
little town called Blackfield was a sort of slum where um, everyone who'd been kicked off the land um, would live in these sort of shacks, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two, um, we had, honestly, in selection, we have two amazing films that the director couldn't uh, attend because of some. It's when I just started becoming interested in filmmaking. Um, and for me, it is so what part you know the intimacy of the film is amazing uh and what i really like about it is that because it takes a very first person approach so it invites us into follow the the investigation or explore what what deborah is, is feeling in relationship to her mother and her mother's deteriorating condition and and that I think is like really, really interesting. So the film works like Deborah Hoffman comes at regular intervals. She sits by her uh, by her desk and she talks to the camera where she reveals her ideas, what, what it is that she's thinking. And then they have some, some kind of animated bits and pieces in between themselves. So the film is structured like that. And, and then gradually the mother is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And Deborah's attempt to try to hold on to her mother is getting more and more desperate. And, and what, what is so, what, what I found so absolutely fascinating with it is that at the end, she's saying, you know, she just kind of, because she's trying to prevent her mother to go into care. She does, she feels very uncomfortable with that. And in the end, when, when she actually takes her into a home and she sees her mother there and she sees her mother being able, being in the environment that is hers, that is an environment that she can understand. Mm -hmm. That's when she starts to say, okay, actually this is where, this is where she belongs at the moment. And that, there is something about that that I find is really, really fascinating because it is also, it is a struggle that we all have about trying to understand the situation and trying to come out of our own frame of mind to just see the situation for what it is, to just, to just engage with it. And I think for me, that is what is very strong about this. So in the end, it's like, you know, Deborah kind of comes to terms saying, well, this is what, this is who she is. You know, it, 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 it creates more stress in her with me trying desperately to, to reverse her to what she used to be and to just say, well, this is what she is. And so, I, yeah, I think it's a really, really beautiful film. And as I said, it was the first kind of film that I saw that was, you know, very based around the filmmaker positioning themselves in a central role as the main reflector of the, um, of the film, of the story, and of the teller of the story. So I, I really, 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 and um, Deborah, her her partner, uh, a woman, is is very much part of the film as well as a kind of a back background story, which I also think is really, really intriguing because it, in those days that was not like something that was very common that you kind of showed your your. Uh, uh, partner that was same sex as yours. So I think that's also kind of adds an element to the film that is also kind of showing, you know, it's all about perception. It's, you know, and how we deal with. And I to, to also to, to think about what you were saying, uh, Manya, it's, I, I also find because my mother is getting uh, really uh, suffering from dementia now. And it is just such a, it is just such a hard thing like what how do you how do you start to relate to it mm -hmm. you know it's like this kind of complete like you know somebody that you knew in one way there is nothing left mm -hmm. it's it's so scary it's it's very scary but i do think that uh, that's why what i really appreciate the complaints of the due to the daughter so much it's like you know there is a positive there is a positive end to it without it being like, uh, you know, too sweet or too kind of trying to bring something together 
um, just for the for bringing stuff together in a good way. It's just like you know, it's an honest way, and it's just like okay, that's it. Maybe this is one of the um, things these films have in common is a lack of being judgmental. Mm. Because I had included a, a, a dementia group in a project I did at the Roundhouse and actually it was really fun being with everybody. They'd start off saying, what year is it? And people would have a wild guess and go, 1938? They'd go, no, a bit later than that. And everyone would laugh. And I remember speaking to one woman saying, you seem all right to me. What are you doing in this group? And she said, actually, most of the time she feels very confused and being in the group was just took all the pressure off that this is who you are now and you can and you can accept that which sounds like perhaps this is what Deborah is doing and the same as say the alcoholics you know in my film who are drunk Absolutely. and who are going this is who I am now yeah. most of the time we're all wandering around trying to pretend certainly now with social media that we're something other than we're not and our lives are full of unalloyed joy and we look fantastic all the time you know <laughs> and so ha having that sense of yeah. I kind of you know what is the best to truth that you can tell about yourself is is a very meaningful thing isn't it and it, and it's and it's a radical thing to do well i think that for me what was really intriguing was this like kind of very very intimate uh observation of the of the of the therapy situation and and to just to listen to people and to see how they relate to each other. You know, you see how the psycho uh, therapist is dealing with the two people. You see how they are dealing with the individual. You see how they are dealing with it together. I think that's that's for me. It's like really key, um, and it and it's so and it's so open. It's so vulnerable. It's so people are really showing something that they are just like you know. You just feel like wow, this is this is kind of. <laughs> this is just unbelievable um and then so so that's one part of the film that i just find it's like absolutely absolutely incredible and then of course there is the ending of the film which reveals the complete setup this is not the, not the uh, mother and daughter it is a mother and it is a daughter but they are not mother and daughter it's not her mother it's not her uh, it's not her daughter so they were because it was impossible to for because i think for pavel this is completely my my interpretation he made a film with his father a couple of years before and the agreement there was that he was going to make it and his father was standing outside because he felt that he had problems with his dad so he wanted to have a real conversations with his father and then he shot the film and then he cut it and then his father wasn't happy with it so he kind of took the footage and he cut his own version of it and it was kind of crazy because they were they were they were being given prizes for the film in the same film festival and they didn't speak for three years or something like that. So they fell out really big time from that. So out of that experience, I understood he wanted, he was very interested in, in making a film about the therapy process, therapy situation. But then of course, realizing very quickly that there is nobody in the world. I mean, a, a psychoanalyst or a therapist wouldn't have, Think that he would never have a client again if he would go in and reveal like a pro the, the real situation between two people. So what he did, he kind of started to say, okay, he sent out like he invited people to if they wanted to be part of the film and to be a mother and to be a daughter, you know. And then so that's that's what is set up. And I find that so intriguing as well, because I think that also gives a it, it kind of allows me to think much, much more complex about the process of therapy for me, because you can see they are not related, but they are just talking about their own experiences and not talking about their own experiences. It, it creates such an intimate space that feels like it's so relevant and it says so much about each of them. And it also shows so much about like the role of the psychotherapist. 
Um, I, f I found it like absolutely, absolutely amazing. And I also think that it is also a film that says something really important about what is documentary filmmaking. You know, what is the truth of documentary filmmaking? How can you achieve different levels of truth through, through actually um, through setting it up differently? And I think this is a very, very good um, uh, example for me of where fiction and documentary is like kind of merging together and it's just creating something that is so strong. <laughs>